Hey, welcome to a C-sharp programming tutorial. We're going to start on a project here called the cargo ship. And in this tutorial, we're going to learn several things about object-oriented programming. So you can see on the agenda here for what we're going to learn on this tutorial includes classes. We're going to create a class that will have methods and properties. So kind of an introduction to object-oriented programming. Also, you can see we're going to use some controls in a graphical user interface. We're going to have a progress bar and four track bars. So here's some details of what we're going to explore in our object-oriented programming lessons. You can see that we have an object here called ship. It's really called a class called a ship. And the ship class has several properties in it, such as its capacity, its cycle count, car count, truck count, train count. It's going to have some methods at the bottom where we can get the ship load and we can check to see if it's over or under loaded and also a two string method. So all of those things will be demonstrated in the video. Now there are a lot of things to learn about object oriented programming and we're going to focus on one of the four principles or four pillars of object oriented programming called encapsulation. So you'll see that in just a few minutes. We're going to make two versions of the application to demonstrate how a class can be imported into more than one program. So this is the graphical user interface. It's a WinForms app. We'll have four track bars and we'll have a progress bar. And so you'll be able to play the game to load the ship to an exact amount. And you can see that each item that goes on the ship, whether it's motorcycles, trucks, or trains, each one of those has a separate uh, weight. And so it's kind of a math game. We'll also create a console version of the app. And so we'll use the exact same class called ship and we'll instead of using a graphical user interface we'll have the more boring console app so the point here is that we can take one class such as the ship and we can use it in multiple types of interfaces whether it's a console app or as a graphical user interface or whether it goes on a web page or in a mobile app the idea of, of classes is that they're portable and they're con and they're encapsulated so all the things that you need are in one bundle and it can be transported from one program to, an, to the next. So with this as our agenda, we're going to start the next video with creating the class called ship and then putting it into two different versions of the game. Now we're going to make two versions of this application. We're going to make a WinForms app and we're going to make the console app so that we can demonstrate that the same class can be used in more than one type of program. So in this video, we're going to focus on the ship class. We're going to create the heart and soul of the application and then in the following videos, we're going to create two different versions of the app. So let's get started with programming a project and making the ship class. So the first major milestone that you're going to reach in this series is going to be an application that looks like this. You can see that we have a ship with a capacity of 255 units, and it asks us how many cycles we want to put on board. So let's say five. How many uh, cars? Let's say five. How many trucks? Let's say also say five and cars, uh, train cars. Let's put in five. And it says here that we have loaded up with 180 units on our ship. So we still have some to go. But that's the game. Now here's the second version of the game. You can see that we have the ship with a capacity of 134. And when I move the slider bars, I can automatically load the items on the ship without having to do any data entry. So it's much more easy to play the uh, graphical user interface than it is the console version. But the heart and soul of the logic of the game is the exact same. So let's get started with the programming. So I'm switching into Visual Studio and I'm at the beginning screen. So let's create a new project and we're going to make a console version. So look for console app .NET framework and that'll be a good place to get started. Okay, so what am I gonna call this? I'm going to invent a name such as cargo ship loader and click create. Now just to prove that my project's working, I'm going to create the hello world app. So I will do a write line and then a read line. So the read line will keep the image on the screen. So there it is, I run the program and I have hello world. So my program seems to be running. Now let's make it do something. Now, since this is an object oriented tutorial, the first thing we're going to do is create a class. So let's right click on the project name, choose add and class. The class that I'm making is a ship class. So let's keep, let's call it a ship with a capital S. Now, as I design my ship, I'm going to add properties to it. So to add a property to a class, you type the letters PROP and then press tab twice. And that will give you a generic uh, property that you can modify. 
Now I've decided that in my version of the game, I'm going to put four different things on board. And so I'm going to call them motorcycles, cars, trucks, and train cars. Now, of course, you could make the same tutorial and make it something else, but uh, you, need, you need to have some kind of a unit size. So these are all integers, and I'm going to call it cycle count, car count, truck count, and train car count. That'll tell me how many of each are loaded on my boat. Just to make things clear, I'm going to put comments at the top that, sh that show what this is. This is a list of properties for my class. Now at the top of my class, I'm going to put in a section called constant values. A constant value is just a placeholder for an integer or some other kind of string or decimal, any kind of a value. And so you decorate it with the word const, or I guess that's how you declare it. And these are all integers that I'm going to create. So the cycle weight, the car weight, the truck weight, and the train weight. Notice I'm using prime numbers for each of these because we're trying to do a multiplication game here. That's really the, the goal of the math game. But I, So I'm using 3, 5, 11, and 17 for my max or for my, uh, for my weight for each item. Pick different prime numbers if you like and you can make a different version of the game. The last constant that I'm going to choose is called the max weight. So I'm going to be using a random number generator to figure out how many of each vehicle is loaded on the boat. And I've decided that there's going to be from 0 to 10 of each of these. You can pick a different range if you like. So when I'm done here, I have a section of constant values. Notice I used all capital letters. That's convention. And then also of the properties. And in C Sharp, properties usually start with a capital letter. If you're in Java, you probably are not going to be using capital letters. Another variable that we're going to have to use is a random variable. This will be used to generate random numbers. Now let's start the next section down, and we're going to call these methods. Methods are really functions. They're synonymous terms. So a class has methods that do things. The first method that I'm going to choose is called getShipLoad. And this will calculate the amount of space that is occupied by all the trains, cars, and my motorcycles that are on my boat. You'll notice that you get an error until you type in a line that says return. And I need to return something here. I need to return an integer because the uh, function or the method is called, it has, a, has the property int as its, as its return value. So I'm just going to simply put in a zero for right now so that way the error goes away. But I, I don't want to return zero all the time. That's just the starting value. Now to show you how these return values work, I'm going to change the int property to a string. And as soon as I do, you see that there is an error down in the return statement says I've returned a zero. If I hover over the uh, zero, you can see that it's not proper to return a zero. It's I promised that I would return a string with this method. And so the zero now causes an error. Well, I want integer to be the return type, so I'm going to return it back to int. So the uh, property called int or string or decimal or whatever you put in there has to be returned because that's what you're declaring. Now what's the word public all about? I've used public on every property here and now I'm using public again on my uh, method name. Public means that you're going to be able to access these properties and these methods from within the program. So we'll, we'll experiment with that once we start importing this class into the actual application. But for right now, just let you know that public means it's publicly accessible. So let's put a note here to see why we're doing this method called get ship load. Its point is to calculate the total weight of the cargo on the ship. So comments like this not only help you figure out what I'm trying to teach you, but they'll also be useful later when you come back to your program a month or a year from now and try to figure out what you wrote. Let's start by calculating the weight of the motorcycles. So let's erase the zero and I'm going to put in the word cycle count. So cycle count is a property. Remember, that's the number of motorcycles that are on the ship. And I'm going to multiply that by the cycle weight, which is the constant I declared above. So this will tell me how much weight a group of motorcycles is. Let's include all four types of cargo now. So we'll have the car count times the car weight, and we'll add in the truck count plus or times the truck weight. And lastly, we'll add in the train car count times the train weight. Now you can put parentheses around this if it helps you figure out the order of operations, but C Sharp is smart enough to know that we multiply first and then add second. So the order of operations in math are automatically applied here. So I think this method is done. We have the comments to tell us what it is. We have a good name for this for the uh, method called get 
shipload, so it makes some sense. And then we have ourselves a return statement. The next method we're going to create is a special one called a constructor. A constructor has to have a special name, and it is automatically called when a new instance of the ship is created. So the specific name for the constructor matches the name of the class. So I'll say public ship. Now a common thing to most, most constructors is that you set the properties during the, uh, the setup. So I'm going to set all four properties to be the value zero. So cycle count, car count, truck count, and train car count are all zero. The last property that I'm going to create in my constructor is called the capacity. Now my capacity is going to be a, a random number. So I'm going to come up with a formula here to calculate the capacity. So let's get started with a formula by choosing random.next and I'm going to choose a number between 0 and 10 and I want to multiply that by the weight of the motorcycle. So that means if there are 10 motorcycles on a ship the capacity would be uh, 30. However, instead of 10, I'm going to swap that out. Do you remember the property that I created at the top in the constant section and it was called max weight? Well, that's where we're coming in here is that we're going to have 10 is the maximum. So I'm just going to put in max weight as this constant value. Now let's continue down the line with all four of these different uh, types of cargo. So we will take a random number times the car weight and we'll add in the another random number times the truck weight and then finally the train car weight. So the capacity is going to work out to be a multiple of all four of these numbers. I just don't know what that multiple is because I'm using a random generator to come up with this. But when we come up with a game, the user will be able to guess or guess and check until they come up with a number that matches the exact cargo weight. Next, I'm going to come up with another method that we'll call over under. And the point of this is to return a value to say how loaded the ship is. So this is a simple math problem. I want to take the capacity of the ship and subtract how much is actually loaded on the ship. So these are both calculated in other places. So the capacity is calculated when we create the ship and then the get ship load will change as the user plays the game. But we will return this number. It's a subtraction problem. The last method I'm going to create is called a toString method. A toString method takes some properties and puts them into a string so that you can use it in a message somewhere in your application. So what I want to return here is a label that we're going to show on the ship. It's going to say the capacity equals and the value of the capacity uh, property. And then I'm going to concatenate the current load string and then use the function called get ship load to come up with the answer. So these will return a string to our program. Now let's address one other issue here. You can see that there is a warning on my two string method. It says here, the ship two string has inherited something from object two string. To make the current member override the implementation, add the override keyword. Now this is all just kind of Greek to you, likely if you've never done any object-oriented programming. So just let you know that methods can be passed from parents to children. Children actually can be created that are like their parents. And so they're saying that if you're going to take a method that already belongs to the parent class, in this, cl in this case an object, then we can uh, override it by putting in the actual word. So in future lessons, maybe in the next course, we'll do more work with object-oriented programming. But for right now, let's we'll just put in the word override and the error goes away. And uh, for their first experience with object-oriented programming, don't get too concerned about what this concept was. All right, so that was a lot of typing. And uh, we're not going to get much coding done other than this, but let's put this into our program. So I'm going to save my uh, class and come back into the program tab. So hello world is here. Let's put in another message. So we're going to simply put in two lines on this video and then in the next video we're going to make it into a game. So I just want to say let's make a new copy of the ship and we're going to call it my cargo ship. And then uh, we're going to do a console uh, right line again and we'll say something about this ship. So the ship is. And I'm going to use the two string method so that way we can get some idea of what's on the ship. Let's run the program. 
So you can see that the program uh, created the new ship and it says the capacity is 154, the current load is zero. This time let's uh, run the program with uh, some new values. Let's add some trains. I'm going to pick, uh, let's say, eight of them and the cycles will add three motorcycles. So we will have something loaded on the ship when we run the program this time. So now you can see that we have a different value. We have a random value sized for the capacity and the current load is 145. So those are both calculated numbers. So it looks like we're ready to start uh, programming the game. So we'll do that in the next video. We've got ourselves a class that's all ready to go. Hey, welcome to the next part of our tutorial on the cargo ship. We're trying to learn about classes and object-oriented programming. In this version of the app, we're going to create a console version that you can play line by line. So at the end of the last video, this is where we left off. We have a version of a very simple game. It basically has no game at all. It just shows a new ship. So let's remove this code and create a game that's interactive. So for the first parts of the game, let's create a new instance of the ship. And I'll just name it as ship with a lowercase s. Then let's come up with a welcome message so that the user can see what the game is all about. So we'll say, welcome to cargo ship. The goal of this game is to load the ship to its maximum capacity by adding motorcycles, cars, trucks, and train cars. And let's tell them how much each weighs. So we'll say a cycle takes three units of weight. A car takes five units, a truck takes 11 units, and a train car takes 17 units. Lastly, let's just print this to the message to the, to the console. So let's say console write and uh, welcome message. So now the main part of the game is going to happen inside a while loop. And so the while loop will be like an infinite number of times until the user gets the game to its winning condition. So what is that condition? Well, the condition is when the ship's capacity is equal to the ship's load. So I'm going to use the not equal symbol, the exclamation mark equals. So while that condition is not true, then continue on. So repeat this many, t many times until the player gets the exact number of cycles, cars, trains, and trucks on the ship. Now, as the loop starts, let's give the user or the player a status update. So we'll first of all tell them how much capacity the ship has. So we access that property by saying ship.capacity. And so remember, that's a randomly generated number. Then we'll have four lines that tell us how many items are on the ship. So the ship has, and then we'll say ship.cycle count for the number of motorcycles. And then, of course, the next one is ship.car count, which tells us how many cars are on board. And then we'll do ship.truck um, count. So it looks like I mistyped that one. But that'll tell us how many trucks are on board. And then finally, we'll do the train car count as the last item. So these five lines give the user a status update to know how loaded the ship is and how much capacity it has. Let's add another line that tells us how much actually adds up to the total number of pounds on the ship or tons or whatever weight we're working with. So we'll say the, sh current, the ship currently has, and then we'll use the method called get ship load and say that this is the total units on board. Now you notice that get ship load is a method. All methods have parentheses to let you know that that's actually a function and you can pass optional parameters inside those parentheses. In this case, there are no optionals, so we'll just leave it as an empty parentheses. Now let's start getting user input. So I'm going to come up with a variable called x, which is simply used to capture information from the keyboard. Then I'll put a message on the screen that says, how many motorcycles would you like to put on the ship? The next line is a read line. So we will assign whatever the user types in to the value x. Now, the string is the data type of a read line. So we need to parse this into an integer. We need to convert it. So obviously, if somebody types in something that's not an integer, the program will have a problem. It will crash. Lastly, let's add the ship cycle count to this uh, property. Let's, let's assign it. And we'll use the x that we just captured. Now we have a model for how to get values from the keyboard. Let's go ahead and change the uh, copy and paste and then change the properties here from 
uh, motorcycles to cars. And we will assign the uh, ship.car count to be whatever X was. And then we'll do the same for the trucks and then for the train. Now you'll notice that we didn't have to redefine what X. We just said X integer at the very top. So each time we come up with a new X equals, the value of X will change depending on what the user types at the keyboard. So the properties of the ship should now be calculated. We have cars and motorcycles, trains and trucks. Now after we've gotten values for all of these four properties, let's do a calculation and find out how much weight the ship is holding now. So we'll just use ship.getShipload as our function that was created in the class and we can calculate it right here in one line. Now let's create some, uh, let's get rid of this empty space here and then right at the end is the uh, ending of the while loop. So if we escape the while loop, that means that the ship has been loaded successfully. So we can just print a message to the console. Now there's other features that we can add here, but let's get this started for now. Okay, I got the app up and running. It says, welcome to the cargo ship. And it tells me the goal and tells me how much, how much each item weighs. Notice the ship capacity is set to 276 and I have zero items for each kind of cargo. And so it says, how many cycles would you like to put on the ship now? So let's put in some numbers. So let's try four. How many cars would you like? Let's try four. And let's just choose four trucks and four trains. And now you can see that it says the ship now has 144 total units on the board. So it looks like we're about half full. So let's try again. So how many motorcycles this time? Well, let's double everything. Let's go to eight, 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 and eight. And we're pretty close. We were at 288. We are 12 units over. So if you know the weight of a cycle is three, we need four less of those to get 12 less. So four less is gonna be four, four cycles. And then we'll do eight for the other four or the items. And then it says your ship is now loaded with 276 total units and it has been loaded successfully. So the game seems to be working. Well, we've got some issues with inputs and we've got some color that we could add to it, but this is the basic core of the app. Now I'd like to add some colors so certain pieces of information are more important than others. So for instance, this line here that says the ship capacity is, I'm going to switch the font color of the console to cyan, which is a light blue. And then afterwards I'll switch it back to white. I'm going to do the same for the uh, line that says the, sh the ship currently has a certain number of total units on the board. I'll change the color on this time to yellow, which will stand out differently than the others. Now let's go down toward the end of the while loop and let's put in some more messages to tell the user if they have overloaded the ship or not. So we will use the function called over under. So ship dot over under. And if that's greater than zero, that means that the capacity is bigger than the total number of items on the ship. And so we'll print a message that is in a foreground color of cyan and we'll say, the ship still has room to spare, load some more items. However, if the ship is overloaded, that means the capacity over under is a negative value. Then we'll say the ship is overloaded and uh, we need to take some items off. And let's change the font color to red. Lastly, let's switch the font color back to white in case we used uh, red or um, yellow here, or cyan. And then finally, the success message, I think should be in green, where it says you loaded the ship successfully. So a little bit of color makes the thing a little bit nicer. Let's go ahead and run it. Okay, so when I run the app, now you can see that the colors stand out. So I can see right away in the blue that 199 is the goal. Let's go ahead and try some numbers. Looks like I need a little bit more, so let's try fives. Okay, it looks like I need 19 more. Let's try, let's see, if I wanted to get 19, I could add a truck, that's 11. So let's try five, five, six, and five. Now what is it? It says we have 191 and we need 199. So that means we're eight short. Eight, I could do three and five. So I need another motorcycle and a car. Okay, so let's try six, 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 and five. And there I got it. Okay, so we've created the console version of the application. Not very pretty, but we can see that it works. 
Now in the next video, we're going to create this version of the app where it's going to look like it's a graphical user interface. And instead of asking for numbers to be typed in at the console, we'll use these sliders or track bars. Just to review what we created here, the cargo hold application shows that we've got a class called ship and it has all of these properties in it. So now you should understand a little bit more about at least one type of object, a game object called ship. So stick with me, and in the next video, we'll create this version called Fill the Boat, and we'll make a graphical user interface. Hi, welcome to what I think is part three of our tutorial for Cargo Ship. This is an object-oriented lesson in C Sharp. We're going to build this game here where you load a ship with cargo. Now, the things that you're supposed to learn through this series of tutorials is how to make a class, set its properties, choose some methods, make a track bar here, and a progress bar. In a previous video, we created this class here called ship, and you can see it has all these properties and all these methods. We also created a version of this application that runs in a console app, so not very pretty, but functional. In this video, we're going to show this application in a Windows uh, WinForms app. So I've jumped ahead to the end of the video to show you what the app will look like when we're done. You can see that these track bars allow us to add items to our ship, and then when we get to an overload, the ship turns red. And if we were to hit it right on as a, an exact number, we would get a green indication that we're done. So here's the next goal. We're going to put all the controls on the screen. So, so if you'd like to do this on your own, I'll go ahead and skip ahead a few minutes. But I'm going to show you how to put all these things in and label them correctly. So we're going to have a picture box. We're going to have a progress bar. We're going to have four track bars so that we can track the number of items in the ship. We're going to have labels above each of those and labels above the, uh, above the, uh, below them as well. And then finally, we'll have a button. So those are all the controls we're about ready to put on the form. So I'm going to start a new project here. And we're going to choose a Windows Forms project and Next. So I'm going to call mine Cargo Ship. And I should probably put two in because I think I already have a cargo ship on my computer. OK, the project's created. So let's make a form that's a little bit larger and put the controls on. OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is just start putting all of the controls on the form, and then I'll worry about naming them later. So first of all, a picture box. Let's make it somewhat the size of what we expect the boat to look like. Then on top of that, let's put a progress bar, and that'll be the indicator to see how big the ship is or how full the ship is. Then we'll put in four track bars. Now, track bars you have to find in the uh, section called All Windows Forms. Apparently, it's not a common form, so they don't put it in that group. So we have four track bars. And then I have a whole bunch of labels. So I want to label above each one of these track bars. And so that will tell us uh, what the number of items on the ship is on each of these categories, such as cars or trucks or trains. Then I'm going to put a label underneath each track bar to tell you what the track bar is about. And then finally, after those four uh, new labels are on, then I'm going to put a button at the bottom. And so when you're done, you'll have a, an entire arrangement that uh, needs to have all of its controls renumbered and renamed. But that's the main idea. We don't have a picture yet for the picture box, but that's coming soon. Let's rename all of the controls for the track bars, because we'll be using those in the computer code. So the first one I'm going to call track underscore cycles or motorcycles. The second one we'll call track underscore cars. The third one is track underscore trucks. And the last one is track underscore train cars. Now, the reason why I renamed these controls is because we'll use those in our code. And it's, it's confusing if you just have them numbered from like track 1, 2, 3, and 4. Next, let's set the text property for each of the labels that are underneath the track bars. So this will tell the user which track bar is associated with which object. So the first label underneath uh, the first track bar is for the motorcycles. And so you remember motorcycle has a value of three units for weight. The second one is cars. And cars should be labeled as five units. The third one is trucks. Trucks have a unit size of 11. And then finally, train cars. And so train cars are listed as 17 units each. So we've got ourselves labels. And they do not need to have their name of the actual label changed because we probably won't change these in the program at all. Now, for the labels that are above the track bar, these are actually going to show the numbers that these track bars represent. 
And so I'm not going to change the text value on these, but I will change the name of the label itself. And so let's use label underscore as our, as our convention. So label underscore cycle count, and then label underscore car count, label underscore truck count, and then finally label underscore train count. And so I'll arrange these so that they are a little bit closer to the top of each track bar. Now just a little bit more nudging to arrange these so that they're straight and we should be good. Now for the cargo ship graphic, I have something online that you can borrow. So I created a GitHub uh, account and have a repository with one file in it. So it's the cargo ship PNG file. And so you can see it here. You can download it and then import it into your program. So I've got the program here. Let's do a save image as, and it'll go into my downloads folder likely. So let's push downloads and save. Now back here in Visual Studio, if I want to change the property of this picture box, I can go down to the image line here and choose the three dots. You can import a picture directly here. Choose the import button and let's choose the downloads folder and there's cargo ship and open. And there it is. Now I want this ship to be, this image to be scaled. So let's go to the image uh, scaling property. So what I'm looking for is size mode and I'm going to choose stretch image so that it fits the entire picture box. Now if you don't like this you can uh, make it narrower or wider or whatever you need to do to make the image look like it's proportional. Now for the progress bar we can check to see if it's working or not by looking at some of its uh, values here. So is there a value? It's at zero right now so let's put something like 45 in there and sure enough it shows that 45% has now been filled. Lastly, Form 1 is the text property here, so let's give the game a title. Okay, it looks like we have all the controls in place. Now we're ready to start programming, but uh, maybe we'll save that for the next video. So hang on, and we'll make this game work in another 20 minutes. Hi, in this tutorial for C Sharp, we're going to finish up with a program called Cargo Ship. We're going to load a ship and we're going to check to see if we can play this game correctly or not. So we're going to code in this video. Now here's the point where we left off from the last section. We have an entire GUI set up, but no code. So we're about ready to start the coding now. Now you notice that we go to the Solution Explorer, we have Program CS and we have Form 1 CS, but we don't have that Ship CS. So where did we get that from and how do we put it in our project? So we can just take a file that we used in another project if we go look for it. So let's go to the folders in my computer explorer, my folders that you can find all the files in. So in my repos, I'm looking for the C drive, the users folder, then my name, and then we have something called source, and then we have repos. Now that's a long way to go, but that's the default pathway that Visual Studio saves its projects. You can see all my projects are here. So what did I use before? It was called shiploader, I think. Let's see if it's in there. So sure enough, there is a ship command. So let's copy that, and then I'm going to move it over to my Solution Explorer and right-click on the name here and paste. And sure enough, ship shows up. Now we're going to change something here. If I open up ship, you're going to see a namespace here called cargo ship loader. And if I look at form one, and let's look at the code inside of there, let's double click on the form. You're going to see the namespace here is for this project name, so cargo ship two. So we can do a import of a project, but you have to remember that the namespaces have to match. So let's just change this one to cargo ship two. All right, so now these projects should be completely interchangeable. We can make them uh, mesh. Okay, we'll switch back to the design view of our program. So let's go to the uh, button called New Ship and we'll start coding there. So I'll double click here and we have the button click handler method show up. 
Now I want to have a ship variable or a ship instance throughout the whole program. So let's go to the very top of our class here and we'll add that. So I want to create a new instance of the ship class and we'll create a, a, a new one that will give us a random number. Also on this button down here where it says ship equals new ship, let's create a new instance of it there. So now when we create a new instance down here, we are reassigning the value of the original uh, variable called ship. So it's a little bit different than the declaration at the top, but it will still give us a brand new ship when we click the button. Let's create a new method, and this is going to be called multiple times throughout the program. It's called update UI. UI stands for user interface. So this will allow us to connect the ship class and all of its properties to the controls that are on the screen. And so we'll, uh, we'll adjust this every time somebody clicks a button. Now the first thing I want to do when I update the UI is set the progress bar. So the progress bar will have a minimum value and a maximum value. The maximum value should be equal to the capacity of the ship. So if the ship has a total space of 250 units, the, the progress bar should also have 250 for its value. Then the value, the actual progress of the progress bar, should be set to the amount of stuff that's in the ship. Now I want to insert a safety check here. I want to check to see if the uh, actual ship load is less than or equal to the capacity of the ship. Because a progress bar cannot have a maximum value that is less than its actual value. The value has to between, be between the minimum and the maximum. So this if statement will prevent an error occurring. Now it just occurred to me that we're missing another label. So on the side of the boat we're going to print a message and it will be uh, a label. So let's put label one out here and let's rename it as ship or label underscore ship label. Now for this ship label, let's go back into the update UI function and let's change the ship label to have a value. So ship label dot text and we're going to set it to be the to string method from the ship class. So ship dot to string will give us the capacity plus the amount of stuff that's loaded. So all of this information that we're putting here on the screen now comes from the ship class. We didn't have to recode this a second time just because we have a second version of the app. So you can see one of the benefits of object-oriented programming is encapsulation where everything is bundled into one package and it can be used in one program or the other. Okay, so now we have this update UI function set. It's not being called anywhere, so it's actually kind of useless right now. But let's say we go to this method here called new ship click, and let's add the update UI command. Let's go to update UI, and we can just simply call it by stating its name with the parentheses behind it. So now that will trigger this method to go. Let's run the program and you can see that we have ourselves the uh, ship on the screen. Now when I click new ship, you can see that the uh, program creates a label and it tells me that it's 261 capacity. I click new ship, the next one is a different capacity. So that is halfway done. Now we have to update these uh, sliders so that they can have an effect on the program as well. So let's switch back into the design of our app and this time I'm going to double click on the first track bar. All right, so the first track bar is double clicked and now we get this method called track motorcycles underscore scroll. So this will occur, this method will occur every time you change a value on the track bar. You notice when you click a button, it's called a click event. Well, this is called a scroll event, very similar. So when we do a movement of the track bar, we're going to adjust the value of the ship's cycle counter. So that means that uh, this, this track bar, by the way, it has a default value of 1 to 10 as uh, values. It, it will automatically update the class property called um, motorcycle count. Now, how does that affect the uh, program itself? So let's go back into update UI and let's make a modification. So inside the method called update UI, we're going to adjust the label for the uh, cycle count. And that's going to equal the value of the ship's property called cycle count. And since that's an integer, we have to switch it into a string. So we'll use the toString method. 
Okay, so now I want to be able to trigger this update whenever we run the uh, track item here. So let's go ahead and call this again. So let's do update UI as a command, and that will trigger the whole method all over again. So let's run it. Okay, so the app is up and running. Now if I slide this track bar, you can see that the value is now showing the, uh, the value of the motorcycle. So if I have up to 10 motorcycles, you can see that the, the label changes and also this track bar is being updated because the update UI function is updating the label and the ship at the same time. So very handy. Now let's do the same process for the rest of the track bars. So let's switch back into the design view. I'm going to double click on the car track bar and uh, let's pretty much copy and paste the values that we had from the previous item. And instead of cycle count, this is going to be car count. And that's all the changes we need to make. Let's go back into the designer and let's double click on the track bar for the truck and paste this in. And let's change the ship's property to truck count and then let's do one more. Let's go back and change the label for the train cars and now we've got ourselves train as the last item. Okay so what else do we have? We have uh, the labels that are incorrectly done so track motorcycles is not what we want. We want to have track uh, this one's for the cars and this one would be track for the uh, trucks and then this one is track for the trains. Okay, I think I got all the labels right. Let's see what happens when I run the program. Okay, so now I start scrolling things and you can see changes occur on all of these guys. Uh, let's see. We have something missing here. So when I move the first item, the label here shows that we have seven motorcycles on the ship. However, these don't seem to affect anything. So I'm missing some commands in the update UI function. Let's go check that. So scrolling up here, we've got ourselves one label being updated. So let's, uh, let's update the rest of them. So the rest of the labels include car count dot text, and that will come from the ship car count property and make sure you put two string on the end. The same thing for the trucks. So we're going to do label dot underscore trucks and then it's going to be uh, the truck count. And then the last one is for trains. So label underscore train count dot text is what you're looking for. And so all four of these labels now should be updated every time we slide any one of the controllers. So let's run the app and let's see if it works. So I'm going to slide this and sure enough this one seems to work. The rest of them all say zero. Now when I slide, they move, and let's see, they all seem to be working. Okay, so the sliders are showing their values. The progress bar is updating. However, we don't have a win-loss condition yet. So we are getting all of the information we need, but we just need to adjust some colors on the progress bar. Okay, so the progress bar, if we check it, it does have a property here called four color. And you can see that it's set to this blue color highlight. So then why is it showing in green? So I found the answer of what we need to do. So let's go over to this program CS and open that up. So there is a line in here called enable visual styles. So I need to comment that out and save it. And so that will remove uh, the default color. So now let's see if we can modify that. Let's go back into one of the uh, controls here. Okay, so now we should be able to change the foreground color on our, our progress bar. So now we're going to change the progress bar based on how full the ship is. So first of all, we'll use the uh, over under command and that, remember, it tells us if we're overloaded or not. If that is equal to zero, then that means that the ship is perfectly and fully loaded. So we'll change the progress bar to green. If it is a greater than zero number, that means over under has uh, still not been loaded yet. So the capacity is bigger than the actual number of items on it. And so we'll set that to yellow. 
And then if we are overloaded, that will be the third case. So that means that the over under value is a negative value and that will be a red color. All right, so you can see that when I run the program, I can now get a progress bar in three colors. If I have not loaded the ship completely, I will have yellow. If I overload the ship, then I get red. And if I were real careful and found the exact answer here, I would get green. But there's still an issue with the visual display here that I want to fix, so we'll get a solution in just a minute. So it turns out that I have to modify this in the code, apparently. So a good place to do this is in the form load event. Now, if you don't have the form load event up on the screen yet, you can create it just by going to the form design, double clicking in the gray area, and form load will automatically be created. So the progress bar dot style is what we're looking for. And then there is an option to set this to an actual progress by <laughs> progress bar style um, property. And it uh, looks like we have continuous and marquee and block. So experiment to see which one you like. So I'm going to see what marquee looks like. Okay, so let's move this thing. And you can see marquee looks a lot like what I have before. I'm going to change it back to the other, which was continuous. So now when I choose continuous, I have a smoother type of uh, item. So it's more granular. And let's see, if you want to see if you can solve this, then you have to figure out the math problem. So what do we got here? 153, and I am overloaded to 156. So I need to take three away. So motorcycles goes down one, and now I've perfectly loaded it, and I'm green. So you've got yourself a, a complete program now. So congratulations, you've got the full program done now. You've done the cargo ship tutorial. You've learned what a class is, that it has methods and properties. And we've looked at the track bar, the progress bar. And so you've looked at the, the ship that we created as the, as the class, and we had capacity, cycle count, car count, and other things. We had methods such as get ship load and over under. And so we have an example of an encapsulated package for a ship. We created this GUI version of the app, of course, which was nice. And then we also created the, car, uh, the, uh, the console version which the point was that you can show that your single class called ship can be imported and repackaged and sent to different versions of your app. So if you wanted to continue this on with a mobile version or a web version, there are different ways to build programs in those environments, but you could still use the same logic of the ship class. There's much more to learn about object-oriented programming than just the, en the encapsulation that we showed today. But this is a good start for most of the things that you'll see at this level of your learning. Of course, I hope you take the next course for Intermediate C-Sharp and we do some more advanced things. So we'll see you soon.